We're filming at the San Diego Jazz Party. My name is Monk Rowe, and we're here for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and I am very pleased to welcome jazz pianist Ray Sherman. And uh, I want to call you a, a plumbing thing, but like a fixture on the West Coast, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> You've been here for most of your life. Uh, right? Yeah, I'm really a Chicagoan, uh -huh. though. I plug my next album. It's called Piano Chicago Style. All right. <laughs> but I, I really, f and I was going through that, putting it together. I really started, yeah, I, I'm a Chicagoan, really. Yeah. <laughs> and I moved out here. I was 16 years old. Uh -huh. But I think your formative years, you know, where you grow up. Yeah. Well, I, Chicago was a, a pretty darn good place to have some formative yeah, years, wasn't it? Sure. And I started thinking about that. I was really fortunate. I mean, even, uh, this was like in the late 30s, well, I mean, or all through the 30s, but I've been starting to listen to the swing bands and whatever, mm -hmm. from about 35 on, and uh, just the local bands, you know, that on the local radio stations, you know, it was just, everything was so great, mm -hmm. that eventually they had got the net networks together. But, but I say just growing up when radio first started, and there was a lot of good bands in Chicago <laughs> that you could listen to. So many people mention the importance of radio in those days, that in the live broadcast too. Yeah. And not just the records. Oh no, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, the, all the the remotes they call mm -hmm. them. How, how was the, how, was the sound good? Yeah, it sounded good to me. I, mean, I don't know. Was, like we were talking about, you know, when I did live TV and the balance was just terrible. Uh huh. And. Uh, in those days, they used to go, of course, the band just stayed in one place, and the singer was there, and they always knew it was the same setup, but they worked it out, I don't, and I don't think they used more than two or three mics, maybe, mm -hmm. one on the piano and one in the front of the band. It sounded great to me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was partly the musician's job to balance themselves, to... That well, that's what I say. I mean, the guys went there and they played, if it was a ballroom or whatever, a cafe, they played so it would sound good in the room. And it was up to this radio station, you know, to do what they could with that. But they didn't seem to have any problem. Mm -hmm. Well, plus we, you weren't comparing it to sound fidelity these oh, days. Oh, no. So. I mean, as far as the balance, you know, like every, yeah. all the instruments balanced correctly. Mm -hmm. I think they needed to put a, 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 a mic in the piano, probably. Yeah. So. Who were some of your favorites uh, on the, on those, in those radio days <coughs> to listen yeah, to? Radio days. Yeah. Just thinking about that. Um, well, the, the I just, uh, funny in those days. Well, I guess well Bob Zerke probably was the first piano player you know listening uh, with the Bob Crosby band. Okay. Yeah, listening uh, as you say, starting to listen to the radio and hear you know the bands that I like and getting to the age where it was really gee that's I want to listen to that say 35 six. I think the Bob Crosby band from from the Blackhawk. I think who did they they followed Coon Sanders I think was in there before which yeah. didn't impress me too much but Bob Crosby band. And then hearing Bob Zerke, you know, uh -huh. I was very impressed with was him. And uh, and of course on records, it was Teddy Wilson, I guess, was the next. Was person. Bob Crosby band uh, with Bob Haggard at that time? That's right. And Ray Baduke. That's right. That's where they wrote the big noise. Yeah. At the Blackhawk. Yeah. At the Blackhawk. That's right. They yeah. they had matinees. Well, I don't. Know, they've told told the story so often. Well, they had you can tell it. They had matinees either Saturdays or Sundays where the college kids used to come down and uh, I, I forgot the whole story, but they just started improvising something, just the two yeah. of them, once. <laughs> <laughs> and that was made history. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I know he just, recent, not well, last couple of years, re-recorded that tune. And Probably. Without yeah. the whistling. The oh. guy, I think he had a guitar player. Yeah, I think it. I heard that. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's cool. Well, yeah, it's it's great too. You know, yeah. do it a lot of different ways. Right. I understand your parents were musicians. Yeah, so that, that was one of the ba <laughs> the bands that I listened to on the air was my dad's band. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's... Maury Sherman, people from Chicago, that remember that period. You know, this is twenties and thirties. You know, would would remember him, and. Uh, my mother also was she she had she worked with a harp and she played violin she worked with a harpist mm -hmm. they had a harp and violin duo you know they played like light classics and uh -huh. things like that 
and they were on the air too. Would they play dinner clubs and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, dinner, a lot of dinner music. So, <laughs> did you do you remember if as a kid you thought your parents were pretty cool <laughs> because they uh, were out playing gigs? I guess that <laughs> I was impressed. I mean, I took it for granted until kids used to come up and say, oh, is your father Maury Sherman? Yes. Then I figured, yeah, it must be special. I didn't <laughs> yeah. know it was, yeah. you know, until that happened. I, right. I mean, there all the music around all the time. You know, that was great. Uh, but as far as, you know, being special, I didn't realize mm -hmm. until kids came up. That was, th that was what they did for a living, I guess. Yeah, and he, well, and he was very well known around Chicago, my dad. Uh, when radio came in, he was like on the air three times a day, you know, from different places. He'd work, uh, you know, like a tea dance, and then he'd work a dinner shift, and then he'd go someplace else, you know, later at night, all yeah. different places. Wow. And, of course, the stations, I guess that was great. Uh, they filled up a lot of time with, mm -hmm. you know, remote broadcasts from, from the different places. And uh, so, he, you know, I, he was like a big name in Chicago. Did they ever talk much about uh, depression years? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact. Um, so we're talking about, yeah, well, it didn't really hit them until about, I think it must have been 33, 34, mm -hmm. 32. Well, you know, it was, the crash was 1929. Yeah. They had their money in, in real estate. And it, and it took about, and you know, he made good money. He had a Cadillac and he had a raccoon coat you know, and all that stuff. And, uh, but they invested it in real estate and the whole thing, I guess, by 1933, you know, everything was, uh, for, you know, mortgages foreclosed and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I knew about that. Yeah. And he, of course he kept working and, you know, he earned a living, but, mm -hmm. uh, but after that it wasn't, it wasn't so, wasn't smooth sailing. Yeah. It changed your family lifestyle? Um, not very much because they, ha they hung on to a couple of buildings. They were in, uh, uh, in partners with my uncle. And so we still, we, they had, there was apartments, you know, that was available to them. Uh -huh. So that, you know, that helped. They, they had, you know, their rent was taken care of. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, I remember... Uh, you know, no more Cadillacs. Yeah. <laughs> it was a 28 Cadillac, I think, wow. I remember it. Yeah. What got you, um, well, you took piano lessons from your aunt, is that right? <clears throat> That's where I started, uh, yeah, my mother's sister. And, uh, you know, that made it easy. And, and then eventually, I guess when I got into my teens, <clears throat> they, had, <clears throat> they had me, uh, go with a, you know, like a, a more, I guess, accomplished teacher, uh -huh. and he, who was also professional, worked as a professional musician. Uh, he was one of, he played, uh, I don't remember, either the romance of Helen Trent or something, the one that had Claire de Lune as oh. a theme song, uh -huh. he's the one that played that. So he was like, he worked in radio, but he was an accomplished yeah. you know, concert pianist, so they, I w they sent me to him, and I, I had to do, he made me do a recital, you know, just like a, you're going to be a concert pianist, yeah. which gets good experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you can handle that, there's yeah. a lot you can handle. Yeah, that, that helps. I mean, that's kind of like we're, what we're going to do here. <laughs> <laughs> Get used to, you know, but playing note for note, that, to me, that's still hard. You know, yeah. gosh, you mean you have to hit exactly what's on the music. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> the the definition of a mistake becomes much clearer at That's that right. point. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, gee, moving from Chicago to the West Coast, that was like a a big thing. Was, <clears throat> was it? Right. Uh, did have, you want to? Oh yeah, you uh, want it? Yeah, uh, it, it was uh, economics. I mean. Like you're talking about the Depression and all that, and in those days, well, I guess any days, I mean, when you, I'm talking about my dad, when you get older, uh, you know, they want new faces and stuff, and he'd been around Chicago for so long. He didn't want to travel because he was a real family man, like got to, you know, in the 
late thirties that the bands just went on the road. That's the only way they could. Mm -hmm. You couldn't stay in one place, and he he wanted he didn't want to do that because he had kids, and you know. Uh, and he he the jobs kept getting the status, you know, kind of went down yeah. over the years. And he thought, well, gee, maybe he could start out here. But I think he really had myself, and I have an older brother who sang. He had us in mind. If we're going to start our career, that would sure be a good place to start, you know, in Los Angeles. So that was another but, one of the reasons. What was the reputation of Los Angeles at that time? Well, well no, this, this was, well, 39, well, oh sure, this was just, just like uh, the reputation now. You know, uh -huh. I mean, as far as being a center for, uh -huh. for the entertainment, I mean, the studios were. Okay. I'm mean, here, I'm talking about Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't so um, much the, the live music. Oh no, that, this, that the, studio, the studio work. Okay. Yeah, and I think they, I, I guess by that time, we all knew that's the most secure place. To be, I guess he thought he wasn't hoping for me to be on the road the rest no. of my life either. Which, I mean, I would have loved to go and play in a swing band. It's funny they never they didn't say don't, but I think they had in mind be better. You know, I could get in the studios. That would be right. much better. You know, so. instead of crisscrossing the country on yeah. a train or in a bus. Yeah. You know, even I mean, it's, I guess especially like with the Goodman and Miller and all those guys. Yeah, what were they four weeks maybe in one place at uh -huh. one for any yeah. length of time? Some of the, like the Basie band or whatever, they'd be more one nighters even. So yeah, that, well, that could be tough. Well, even my dad's day, it was like you'd play a location for four to six weeks, and of course back east you would you would do one nighters in the in the summertime, mm -hmm. like during the winter you'd be four or six weeks here and then jump around and. Then, during the summer months, you'd go on one-nighters. Uh -huh. So when was your first, uh, was it before you left or <coughs> after that you first started playing out in ensembles? Oh. oh, well, no, I moved into Los Angeles. I was 16, okay. so I joined the union there. And I was still going to school. I would work weekends, your club dates, they call them, you know, whoever. You know, it wasn't. I mean, not a lot of guys want to take a chance as a 16 year old, but I, I would, uh, he, my dad knew, you know, people that knew him, and so he contacted people, that, and I got to working, and uh, then I got, a piano player, you know, can do so many things. I played in a couple of places where it was piano alone with vocalists, mm -hmm. and uh, as soon as I, I graduated high school, which I was 17 when I graduated. Then I got to working steady, like doing that, you know, kind of like a cocktail, you know, yeah. place that had singers and you play for them. And uh, I think, oh, I don't know if anybody remembers, Jimmy Walsh. That was the first band that mm -hmm. I got to play with. <coughs> and that was at uh, the Casino Gardens, in the, that's kind of famous, in uh, Ocean Park. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was my first band. He was in there, a good band. He played trombone very good. Uh -huh. Like about 12 piece. You know, it's a ballroom, yeah. casino garden. And uh, well, let's see, one thing. I, I, di uh, I didn't play with any name people. I arranged for Jan Savitt, you know, before I went in this service. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 19 when I went in the service. So I, I had her, I arranged for Jan Savitt, and just when I got my notice, my draft notice, he sent me a telegram to come and join the band you uh -huh. know, right at that time. And you joined the service, was it uh, around 40, no, four, uh, 43? 43. <coughs> was it, um, at that time, when you were going to the service, was it a question of, I'm going overseas? You know? uh, well, <laughs> it's funny, I don't know, it's, in those days, People, I don't know, they weren't as sensitive about it. maybe it's since the Vietnam thing. Like if you could work deals, you know, nobody put you down. You know, if you, you had connections mm -hmm. where you could be in the, stay in the country for the duration or whatever. I mean, everybody, you know, fine, go, you know, do it. And uh, my, my dad knew Gil Roden, you're familiar mm -hmm. with him. And uh, he was up in Vallejo <laughs> with Ray Baduke. They were both in the same group up there. 
And I don't know how my dad knew that, but he and he contacted uh, Gill. You told him I'm going to be drafted, <clears throat> and if he could work something out, that I could go up and join their band. And of course, the army bands were always looking for mm -hmm. guys, and th I think it was a legitimate uh, thing. I mean, you just couldn't pull somebody that just happened to come to the, to the base. You know, oh, there's a piano player. I mean, you had to get them from someplace. Yeah. So. So Gil said he'd, he'd see what he could do, you know, to get me up there, because they did need a, a mm -hmm. piano player. Well, quite a few of the, the people I've talked to had positive musical experiences in the military. Yeah. Well, they were considered important, you uh -huh. know, morale, you know, and all that stuff. Right. We, we played parades, you know, we played uh, then the dances and the officers' clubs, you know, for, played for everybody. We were working almost every day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think they, they thought it was important. Mm -hmm. In the draft, it, 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 in those days, it was just expected, right? Almost, that you, you, you were going to go in the service. Yeah, any, any what they, you know, physically able guy, I mean, in a, in a certain age limit, sure. Yeah. And, oh, uh, well, I didn't tell the whole story, but anyhow, so I got it, I was drafted, and then they sent me to Texas for basic training, which was out of the, uh, whatever they call it, the Vallejo is in a certain District. region, uh -huh. or whatever they yeah. call it. And Texas is a different region, and I got there, and the, the guys are telling me, you know, the, uh, oh, they'll never get you, because this is in a different region, they can't do that. And uh, I had almost given up, and we were getting to the end of, you know, basic training. And I said, hey, I don't, you know, you wonder how things happen. I, I got the flu, and they put me in the hospital. So I was there a little longer than the other guys, you know, in, in my training unit. And I was in the hospital, and the, one of the, uh, what they used to call them, the guys in the office came up and, hey, your thing came through to go to California. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I, it's funny, I wasn't scared or whatever, but when I think back on it, but that was like, you know, by, <laughs> by a thread. Yeah. A, a timely illness at that point. Well, I, to, I to often wonder, like, if I would have been shipped out. Or, yeah. That would have been it. But, well, no, I, I had an ace. <laughs> I, I had something up my sleeve. <laughs> they, got, they had a good band there. It was uh, uh, Camp Wallace in Texas, near Houston. Mm -hmm. And the band leader there told me, well, gee, if they don't send for you, we could use you. Yeah. So, can always use a, a good piano player. Yeah. I guess at Texas, a little better than going over. over I shouldn't I say suppose. that. Yeah. <laughs> no, Tex Texas is great now. In those days, it wasn't considered uh -huh. <laughs> too terrific. <laughs> right. Um, when you return to California and after the service, is this when the studios beckoned you? Uh, yeah, the, I don't know. I keep saying, "Oh, it took a while," but I, well, I never thought about it. We got, I got back, and uh, well, I had worked with you know Baduke in the service, and uh, I, 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 see, I, I should write all this down I? Yeah. for my memoirs. At one point. No, I, that's right. I, I came back. Oh, I, I went to work. Oh, I went to work with Sabbath. That was the first guy mm -hmm. back at the Casino Gardens. And, that, and he had the band in there, and uh, I worked with him and wrote a couple arrangements. And, you know, for a few weeks, they used to change bands, you know, three, yeah. four weeks. And it was coming to the end of that engagement, and he called me in the back, and he says, Oh, and, and then after that, uh, Will Osborne had contacted me that he was going to go up and down the coast with a performing a new band. And would I come with him? He's got Jimmy Mundy is, is writing the book. And uh, Eileen Wilson is going to be the singer, you know. Oh, yeah, it's nice. I, mean, I never had been on the road with a band. That's what I'd always, gosh, wouldn't that be great, you know. Yeah. So finally, <clears throat> but anyhow, the... So before we were th through on the Sabbath thing, he called me back. He said, yeah, Ray, what are you going to be doing, you know, after this? I said, oh, I thought, I, I, Will Osborne called me. I think I'm probably going to do that, go up and, 
He said, yeah, I think you ought to stick around town. I may have a radio show. And I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be with a swing band on yeah. the road. Right. <laughs> and he did. He got the, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 what was the, the movie credit? Not, 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 not Hedda Hopper, the other one. Uh, oh. <laughs> Probably won't know this. Yeah, well, it'll come to me. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, he had this. He got this show. It was just he—he he was a fiddle player, you know. Uh -huh. he, he loved classical music, and it was like a string quartet. And I think there probably was Celeste or something. I think there was a keyboard on it, and the theme song was "Pictures at an Exhibition." You know. No kidding. Yeah, because it was about movies. You know, that was. Uh -huh. there so you go. that was his thing. Um, I'll think of her name. Gosh. This kind of fat lady. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, so that, but I, you know, I didn't want to do that. I mean, gosh, that was, I didn't want to settle down into uh -huh. that. So, and the road trip was terrible because the drummer was just terrible. Everybody was great except, and you know, if you have a bad drummer, forget it. <laughs> you wow. know, no matter how good everybody else uh -huh. is and good arrangements. So I learned my lesson. <laughs> So much for the road. Yeah, 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 that was the last time. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. I, well, one night, yeah, I, I went up to San Francisco a couple of times with Sabbath. Uh huh. I, th I don't know. I must have been after that. Yeah. But that's that's as much. Now. I'm on the road now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you end up doing the radio thing? Oh, so then. Uh, Worked a little, a little around town. Well, I mean, with Sabbath and worked with Jerry Wald, I remember, at Trocadero, you know, places around town. I'm trying to think when the, I, I got the uh, Judy Canova sh show. Radio. No, the first one was Abe Burroughs. Do you remember him? No. Oh, he, he's famous. He's as a, as a uh, musical comedy scriptwriter. Oh. But he wasn't then, but mm -hmm. he, he was like a, a writer, you know, for whatever. And, well, you have to know who he was. <laughs> he was a funny guy. He used to write these funny songs, and he would entertain at parties, and he got so good, you know, famous doing that that they hired him to do a, a radio show with these funny songs he used to I write. See. And, but it was a good little band, uh, 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 Milton DeLug. That name, sure. It was his band, just a little group, about five, six, and he wrote these real complex arrangements. We all, maybe one number we had, but it was really hard, <laughs> you know. And you had to really read it, and, uh -huh. and, and we'd we'd play that. We'd rehearse, go in and rehearse, and then we'd have like about two or three hours off before the show. I remember I'd come back to the show, and it was like I'd never seen oh. seen this music well. before. <laughs> it was. And it, it was, was live, of course, right? Yeah, and that, yeah. yeah, there were two broadcasts, I think. I'm pretty sure. In those, I'm not sure. If, or if they had tape. I think they had tape by those days. Mm -hmm. For the, you know, they had an East Coast broadcast and a West Coast broadcast. We, we didn't talk about the Tommy Dorsey. You know. No, I was just, I was looking at my <coughs> notes here. Yeah, that, well, well, that's I when wanna, I was still in Chicago. We can, we yeah. can rewind. Let's yeah. talk about that. And then I had something to ask you about in the service, too. Yeah, well, that, that just reminded me about the East Coast and the West Coast. The, it was Tommy Dorsey had the Raleigh and Cool show that was called the um, Amateur Swing Contest. Mm -hmm. And it was a half-hour show, and he would do it from whatever theater. You know, they're touring around playing theaters, whatever town they were in. They would do the show, and they would uh, have auditions, you know, a couple of weeks before the band was coming in each town that they were in. And so I auditioned for that, and I got on the show. And, and the first, the East Coast broadcast, I think it was Barnes, is that the guitar player? George Barnes. George Barnes, I mm -hmm. think, won it. Oh. He was older than me. I was 15. I think he was about 18 or 19. <laughs> but you were, you, you were supposed to be amateur. You couldn't yeah. belong union, you know, or whatever. Uh -huh. And so he was eliminated. <laughs> and I won the, the West Coast broadcast. Oh. Okay. Because in, in those days, we should explain, there was no tape. In the show? And the, in order to do the, have it on at the same time in New York and at the same time in L.A., they had to do two broadcasts. You're right. Yeah. And who were the judges of this? 
Huh? The audience, the applause meter. <laughs> oh, I get Yeah, okay. Well, it's like Ted Mack. Yeah, in a big theater, you know, that yeah. makes sense. Cool. Yeah, so I got all second broadcast, I got the most applause. And you played Honeysuckle Rose? I played Honeysuckle it? Rose, and I remember, I don't, are you familiar with the Dorsey Brothers record <coughs> of Honeysuckle Rose? A little bit. Because I had memorized all the oh. solos on that, oh. and I played a little bit of Tommy Dorsey's solo. Oh. <laughs> and I kept looking at him, and he didn't react at oh, all. Yeah. No. <laughs> Maybe he thought I was putting him on. <laughs> Just, Maybe he didn't recognize it. <laughs> well, he played, you know, which is another tune uh -huh. that he incorporated. So I thought it would be pretty obvious. Yeah. Well, that's neat. Yeah. What what did you get for that? Oh, price? I wanted some money. I forgot uh -huh. how much. But the big <coughs> biggest thing is, my, as a special thing, my dad took me to the Blackhawk after the broadcast. You took to, you to the what? To the Blackhawk to see the Bob Crosby oh, band, okay. which I'd never seen live. Uh huh. And he knew. God, I love this band. I listen every night on the radio. He was probably pretty proud of you at that time. Oh he? yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, and he introduced me, you know, yeah. because they all knew him. <coughs> and so I got to meet everybody. Cool. Yeah, that's, I guess I remember that, you know, more than anything. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I wanted to ask you about, in the service, was the, the, was the service, <coughs> the bands you were in, was it uh, totally segregated? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at that Def time. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is not nice, but it's funny. I don't think anybody even talked about it. It wasn't an issue at that No, point. it's funny, I don't remember it ever coming up. We had Latin guys. You know, so. but except when we went to Texas, it was a problem for the Latin guys. Oh. Remember, we were, <laughs> we were really reminiscing here. Uh, we we did <coughs> while we were in Texas. We eventually left Vallejo and we were transferred to a couple of different places, and we ended up at Fort Hood. It was Camp Hood then in Texas, and we we there's we went on we went on one nighters with a with a a bond selling show. We go to all these different towns, and they would have these Purple Heart guys come in, and they would demonstrate how you. Big fox, how <laughs> you jump, you know, like battle scenes. They would no kidding. Yeah, they in, would in big like uh, uh, outdoor places. Mock know. invasions and all that. Yeah, yeah. And, and they would do that, and we, I think we probably played some marches, and then after they would have like a dance, you know, with the USO or something. Yeah. You know, we would play for that, and then we were touring around, and the into the Latin, and then some of the guys were going to bars. I didn't drink, but. They told me this, that the guy, you know, in the band, we had a couple Latin guys in the band, and, and they'd go into bars, and they had like a white line back, you know, before you got up to the bar. And the Latin guys had a stand behind that, where they couldn't come up to the bar, they had a stand behind that white line. I guess somebody bought the drinks and brought it to them. Oh dear. Isn't that terrible? And I, mean, I guess that's only one of the things I didn't realize. You know, the, the Latin, you know, Mexican-Americans had yeah. that. I, then I found out I had never heard that. <clears throat> so, but that's, as far as race things, that's the only mm -hmm. thing I was aware of, in the, yeah. you know, during the service. When you got into the studio scene in, uh, was in Los Angeles, is that right? Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea that you'd be making a 30-some year no, career well, out of that? Uh, let me think, we got back, <coughs> you know, after, uh, eventually, well, I got that, I guess the, the Judy Canova show. Well, see, I was married by then, mm -hmm. and that, that made a difference. You know, I didn't want to be traveling around either, and, we, you know, we had, had a child, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, that started to sound good to me. Yeah. And especially, gosh, all these great guys from the swing bands were... We're in the studios, you know, in the radio orchestras and the movie studios. And uh, so I, I think, well, uh, you know, I was talking about Burroughs and that, that band. Uh, uh, Vince Terry was the guitar player. <coughs> I don't know if any of these names, but they were all first class players. And of course, Milton. And, 
cut. I had seen Milton playing with Manny Klein, you know, and uh, uh, Maddie Malnick, you know, that little group that they had. Uh, I think they called it Mal Maddie Malnick had a little group if he was a fiddle player. Uh -huh. I think that was where uh, Milton got his start, and Manny Klein oh. was the trumpet player. In that. Uh -huh. You know, so these, gosh, if you play with guys like that, it's not like when I was in Chicago, the studio bands were really corny, especially the Chicago bands. Oh. The, you know, the, the house bands. That, you know, we, I listened to the remotes. I did. They, there were sustaining programs with the, the house bands, and they were really pretty corn. They were old-fashioned, uh -huh. you know. But, you know, by after the war, you know, they had the best swing players, you know, in those groups. So, you know, that sounded good to me. And I remember uh, a friend of mine, Bob Bain, was in, the guitar player, he was... I guess doing that show with uh, the Judy Canova show, and he lived in like in Beverly Hills. We lived way out, you know, in the end of the San Fernando Valley. And one night he came out and in person <laughs> to tell me that that they're going to use me on the on the Judy Canova show. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it was it's status yeah. too, you know, for musicians. Uh -huh. uh, gosh, all these experiences are coming back to me. I I did a. After I'd been in, you know, doing radio and studios for a while, I did, uh, Stan Kenton did a show from the Palladium, and, you know, he was always the piano player in his band, but, oh. the, but this time he wanted to stand up, you know, and like, you know, all like the bands Tuscany did on, on the, he was good at that anyhow, yeah. you know, he looked great in front of a band, so he was going to conduct, and he was going to hire a piano player for that. And, to, and, you know, to play the band numbers, and he, they called me to do that. And I think Shelly Mann was in the band, and uh, I got trombone player. Oh. But they, and they, I, you know, looked up to these guys like, God, that's the top of the world. You know, uh -huh. the guy Stan Kenton's band, you know, and that's yeah. when he was very big. And then, of course, you know, Shelly Mann was like, yeah. you know, winning downbeat polls. And right. All. And they were coming up to me and like, thinking how great it was that I was in the studios. Wow. And of course, which eventually they, they got into. That uh -huh. was their goal, you know, to do that. So, yeah, it's interesting yeah. how sometimes you look at what, uh, what yeah, other people are doing. And, <laughs> that's right, and they're looking at you and yeah. saying, gee, I want to do that. And well, of course, they had had that. I mean, yeah. I, I never had that, so I would have probably got to that point, too, if I had it, yeah. you know. But they had <laughs> done that, been there and done that. Yeah. You know, big big, uh, you know, jazz band guys, uh -huh. big band guys, and that was the next step, right. you know, get into the studio with good pictures and all that. So, being a studio <coughs> musician, um, you go to work, the studio. Well, it was all freelance when I, oh. when I, just when I got into it, the con they, had, you, they had contracts, you know, up until then, <coughs> where they, you know, had like house bands, all the studios had their own group, and, uh, and I, during that period, I was doing radio. I finally did Phil Harris show. I have to think of what shows I did. And I was starting to do records. And uh, there was also quotas. If you did movie studio work, you could only do a certain number of records. You couldn't do radio at all, I don't think. If you did movie studio, they tried to divide up the oh. work, you know, among all the guys. So I was like in that field, you know, doing radio and, uh, and records. And then uh, the, the contracts went out, and it got to be everything was freelance. And that's when I started to get calls, you mm -hmm. know, to do picture calls. <clears throat> but uh, I, I've always, you know, loved the idea that I never had it. Because it was like going to an office, yeah. you know, with those guys that, that were under contract to studios. Did this give you any, um, you know, this is like a 90s question. Did you get health benefits and all that kind of stuff? Uh, not, that kind of work? not right away. Uh, it was, um, <clears throat> in fact, took a long time <laughs> before they got that. But the scale was good. You know, mm -hmm. was, I mean, compared to whatever other work there was, that was the best scale. Was, uh, and you were, as I say, with the contracts, you were on a yearly basis and whatever it was. Oh. You had to divide it up. That was guaranteed so much money a, I you know, see. a week. You signed up for a year. But anyway, when I got into it, it was just, uh, I, I don't know exactly, but I know compared to other work, it was the highest 
per hour scale, and I guess three hour minimum call. Uh -huh. you know. Can you tell me what it was? Do you remember? I don't remember. I remember the radio shows were like $35, $36. That's <laughs> but of course, for a three hour well, session. Well, including, including the uh, rehearsal and, and yeah. doing the show. Mm -hmm. When I first started radio, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Well, that was decent money back then. So well, as I say, this yeah. was 19, early 50s. Uh huh. Maybe late 40s with the 49 or 50 or something. Uh -huh. so, anyhow, so I, at that period, I was doing radio, a few radio shows, and then I started to, to work. And Pollock called me, and I always thought, gee, that would be the ideal. You have a couple radio shows, and then you work with a good jazz band, you know, in some club at night. Mm -hmm. And so that finally happened, and uh, I wasn't, <laughs> after a while, I wasn't too crazy about going to the same place every night and playing the same tunes, you know, even with good guys. Yeah. So you live and learn. Uh -huh. But it, it was a good career move, though, I think. I mean, that's, re I started out to be a jazz piano player, so right. I couldn't not do that, <laughs> you know, if somebody asked me to do it. So, and I was with Pollock a long time, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, I had probably two radio shows. I don't think I was getting record dates at that time, because that would have conflicted, because record dates are in the evening a lot. Yeah. So, nowadays, you know, they send a sub and all that. I don't think, I don't think Pollock would have been too crazy no. about that. Uh -huh. No, they probably could have done it. I, I just never, it never came up. This was a, what, five or six piece group? Yeah, uh, like Dixieland band, yeah. three horns and three rhythm. Right. And, uh, no, Matty uh, Matlock was in the band. I, yeah, he, he had, you know, record dates and stuff. And he used to send, like they, they had a, a good sub, you know, that, yeah. that stood by. I probably could have done that. But, but anyhow, that, it didn't come up. And, um, I don't know, the, the job finished. It seems like everything kind of coordinated, you know, just right, it's finished. And then I started to get, you know, get record date calls. Yeah. And it's funny, that was the days of, of I, I guess, I don't know if they even called it rock and roll, rhythm and blues, or with the triplets in the right hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. started getting a lot of calls like that, uh -huh. where that's what they wanted. <laughs> Can you recall some of the Records you well, I, th I think the only hit I was on wa was uh, something Lane, uh, Primrose Lane. Primrose Lane. Primrose yeah. Lane. And I think yeah. I, I play. I faked uh, an introduction on that, and they always say, "Oh, you, you know, it evidently whatever I did was good." Became a little hook. Yeah, that yeah. they uh, they because I did a record date after that. It was funny. A friend of mine. Uh, Jack Marshall, you know, guitar player, I don't know. It was one of his dates, and he came over to me and said, do you think you could play something like the guy played on Primrose Lane? <laughs> for the well, intro? maybe. <laughs> but I didn't realize that that was considered an important part you know, uh -huh. of the record. Neat. <laughs> but I, I don't, I think I was another one, The Big Hurt, does that ring a bell? Sounds like something from a... It one of the vocal groups. It was a, a solo, a singer. Yeah. A, a female singer. Uh -huh. The other was a male singer. And, you know, just, a, I think that, if, you know, you could look them up and they're probably on, right. on some list. And that had a gimmick. Radio recorders got to be a famous place, I guess, recording studio. This is when they were kind of making the record. And the guy owned it, you know, and he was the engineer. And he had this thing, he had some kind of filter <laughs> that he he put the, it, it got a very strange sound if you ever hear it. Uh, I, you, know, you know, if there was an effect on it, yeah. you know, that he used. On the there's whole a record, there's a name the for it. I don't know what they call. It. Yeah, I think it went through the whole record. Yeah. A very ethereal kind of effect a, a he put in. It, or a yeah, phaser. one of those kind of things. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Exactly. Some, yeah. I, there's a name for it. I, yeah. I forgot what they call it. And, uh, yeah, like a filter that changes uh, pitch, uh -huh. you know, and goes up and down the spectrum. Yeah, you know, kind of like that. <laughs> Although she sang, the gal sang good. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, good musicians, pretty good tune. You know, for pop tune. Yeah. Uh, 
so I did a lot, of, a lot of that, and I said most of them weren't his. But I guess, who knows, they probably sold. You know, yeah. For capital, I think, mostly, uh -huh. I worked. And, uh, and I, then I started getting movie calls. Right. I don't know if it was... Uh, I remember working with Nelson, Nelson Riddle, on uh, uh, Little Abner, which may have been one of the... That's the one that I remember. It was in the early, early yeah. yeah, one of the early calls I uh -huh. had. And it seemed like I kind of got in the, the pool, you know, like the contractors have lists of people. Mm -hmm. And you get on their list and you, and you start getting, you know, like two, three calls a week or something. Let's talk about live TV for a moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about the Hollywood Palace. I, it was actually tape, but, but I mean, whatever they call it, live on tape. Uh, in, 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 well, it's the palace, you know, in, in Hollywood. It was an old theater they made over, kind of made over. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard, I didn't realize it in those days. I guess I, I didn't expect that much because I'd go home and listen to the show and, oh, yeah, I can hear myself or whatever. But I, saw, I heard there was a film clip, uh, part of the Nicholas Brothers. There's like a, a biography of the Nicholas Brothers that they show every once in a while on A&E. Mm -hmm. And there's one of, their, one of the things they did at the Hollywood Palace. And God, it sounds like we're playing in a big gymnasium, and the mic is at the other end. Of yeah, the, yeah. And it's it's like uh, they didn't have even have our mics on. Like the mics were on the stage, uh -huh. and we were like back way off, almost up, like where the balcony is, over to the side. That's where we were with glass all around us. But that's supposed to be, you know, for to, for isolation. So when the singer sings on the stage that uh, the band isn't leaking into the mics, but it, but it was, and it was must have been leaking into the mics so bad that they turned off our mics. Because oh. uh, that's what it sounded like. Uh -huh. And I couldn't believe how... And now you see, like, shows th that are... I mean, it's, you know, they're live on tape, whatever, like the, uh, the uh, award shows and all right. that, and they get great balance. Yeah. But I guess they took well, a while to figure out. Well, things have come a long way. You <laughs> yeah. know, technology and, and all that has come a long and, way. And the music was all, you know, it was always, how is it video-wise? You know, audio-wise was, uh -huh. you know, that, that was, nobody thought that was very important. And like we'd be a mile away from the singer and all that. You know, yeah. it's terrible to try to do something decent. But that's why we're there, you know. I finally figured out, like, they want the best guys there because un even under the worst conditions, it'll sound good <laughs> if you have the best guys. Yeah. Do you recall any um, times when things really fell apart? Uh, no, that, that's interesting. Uh, of course, it got to be with tape. Uh, at first, it was you were live to the, to the East Coast. I guess they still do, like, The Tonight Show and all that. Mm -hmm. It's live to the East Coast, and it's, they make a tape as they're doing a live show, and they play that for the West Coast. But it got to be that if there was a goof, you could just... It wasn't live ever. It was just tape. Uh -huh. uh, I, oh, Jerry Lewis. Do you remember that? <laughs> he, ha he tried to do a, a live. He, boy, he really wanted to do it live. And that was but just before the Hollywood Palace went on, because mm -hmm. that's... It was the Jerry Lewis Theater originally. He's the one that had it all refurbished and put the sign out there and everything. And it, I don't know, it lasted about eight weeks. No, yeah. it, was, it was a big flop. But, yeah, he really, he wanted to do it live. I, I don't remember any big uh, mm -hmm. goofs. Uh, well, like, you know, they did all those Playhouse 90s and all those things. Right. Well, but people go on the stage every day and do sure. stuff live. Sure. So. And the radio shows, though, I used to just, God, those trumpet players, and there's that, you know, a, you know, a high, whatever, B flat or C, mm -hmm. at the very beginning of the show, there's the red light, and boom, <laughs> you know, and you never hear any, you know, big flubs. Uh -huh. God, how can they do that? I, well, I, I, 
telling everything. It's <laughs> just gonna their edit job. It? You're going to edit just their it? job. Well, some of it, but... Because what my first show on the Phil Harris show, uh-huh. I mean, this, this was live. Uh, well, I, I guess I should in interpolate. There was tape. And Alice used to tape her numbers, Alice Faye, because she didn't want to deal with that. She oh. taped it. Uh, I think... I don't know, I guess she performed it, though, during the show. But they had a tape of it that they could splice in there, you know, if she didn't like what she did uh -huh. know, during the broadcast. But anyhow, the first show I come on, and the very first thing on the air, you know, f no announcements, or just a, the Phil Harris show. Uh, uh, Phil had made a record where Stanley Reitzman played an intro on a record. You, well, Stanley was kind of famous, I don't know. And he wanted to do that number, and he wanted that intro, just like uh, Stanley played it. And it's piano alone, no bass, no drums. And I had to play it note for note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, that's a hazard right there. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and uh, sitting, I'm just like those trumpet players must feel. I'm waiting for that red light to go on. Oh, and the blood is <laughs> draining. <laughs> but I made it. Did you? Yeah. But that was a, a good initiation for uh -huh. live radio. Right. Mm. Tell me about um, the movie, Pete Kelly's Blues. Yeah, that, that was... That. Uh, Is that the one with Jack Webb? That's right. It's getting to be kind of a cult, cult. <laughs> cult thing now. Because uh, it, was, it wasn't really panned, but there wasn't much, you know, good said about it when it first came out, but I noticed now they play it on A&E, no, yeah. not on uh, movie classics, or well, movie classic, and they say three stars. <laughs> so it, I think people think more of it now than they did in those days. I always thought, oh, gee, he's, uh, have, you, uh, have you seen it? Or, yeah, I've seen it. He's, he's kind of trying to do Orson Welles or something, you know, in his, he directed it. Oh. And, but I mean, that's a pretty good model, <laughs> you know, Orson Welles, but I thought, Maybe the, the critics thought it was too derivative, you know, the things, the way he oh. directed the thing. But it was certainly original, you know, with all the music and these. Well, it's interesting, too. I think now that we look at that, we, we see him doing the dragnet thing. Yeah. And, you know, th that colors the way oh, we look at him. Oh, personally, yeah. Because he was very similar, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, that thing. And he now, didn't do much different, yeah, right. in any of his roles. He was a little more animated, uh -huh. I guess. But who was the, who was the singer in it? Well, the, Peggy, uh, Lee, Peggy was Lee was in it, and also Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, and oh yes. Yeah. But there's a scene in that movie um, where Peggy Lee is like in a institution, That's right. yeah. and she's singing this song, uh, mm -hmm. "I Can See a Rainbow." Yeah. Uh, Red uh, and yellow and. Yeah, the Arthur Hamilton wrote oh, that. Oh, it's a really touching scene. Yeah. No, I say I think people are seeing now. You know, maybe it was well, he, like his intentions were really good. You uh -huh. know, Jack and what he was trying to do, even if everything didn't come off. Yeah. You know, a grade A, but uh, you know, he got close in a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of those parts. So yeah, and the fact that that it had respect for for jazz. You know, the guys that play jazz. Yeah. He gave us all credit. You know. Uh huh. And so that, uh, yeah, I did the soundtrack, and I was also in the picture. Not all of the guys were, mm -hmm. but some, a few of us were also in the picture. Some of guys were too busy. See, if you, when you do, when you're photographed, you don't get paid as much as when you record. Oh. You know, that's what called sideline, if you're Okay. Right. So a lot, of, you know, they couldn't really afford it. It was 14 weeks or something that we had to uh -huh. commit. I see. You know, to... You'll be on call, and you have to be there. And the guys, you know, like Nick Fatul, they couldn't. He he was on the soundtrack, but he couldn't. Oh, uh, he was too they have busy. somebody fake his part. Yeah, yeah. I think they uh, they it was an acting part anyhow, so maybe that issue yeah. didn't come up. But uh, I, some of the guys were just too busy recording, you know, to be able to do that. And they knew that, you know, what in front that they wouldn't. But I guess with Nick, they oh that'll work out because we need an actor, you know, for that anyhow. Did you think it was pretty cool to see yourself in that film? Yeah, yeah, it was kind of a kick. Yeah, 
especially now to see how young I was. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, well, then you've, uh, after your studio days, you came back to... Well, yeah, so 30 years passed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's right, it was just freelancing uh -huh. in, in uh, you know, TV and movies and records, right. you know, for that. Long, I don't, I don't think I worked any clubs after the thing with Pollock. But uh, eventually you got to do uh, the Bob Crosby that, kind uh, of a, that special. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I had worked a little around, you know, he booked jobs around town. And yeah, I still did sing, single engagements, you know, like yeah. that. People would call me and I would do. In fact, I did like what regular club, did, what they call club jobbing, they call it in Chicago. Yeah. You know, private parties and stuff. I was all during that period. Right. I, because at least that you could sit down and fake, you know, yeah. something even if it was, a lot of it was society, you know, like Lester Lannan or whatever, yeah. but it was rhythmic and we worked with a guy who would, once in a while we get to play jazz solo, you know, mm -hmm. we had uh, Ralph Collier, you remember that? Yeah. Played drums, I remember. He was with, he was with the Goodman Band when, mm -hmm. when Peggy Lee was in the band. And, you know, so we had good guys, Mike Rubin, who uh, was with the Raymond Scott Band, I think he was a bass player. You know, and the, le the leader, you know, he was, it was a society band, but people were, had grown up during the swing era, so it, Kind of play with yeah. a good feeling. So that, I mean, you know, Saturdays and Sundays or Fridays right. sometimes, and you didn't usually get st studio work on Saturdays and Sundays, uh -huh. so I could work that in. Yeah, because that would be overtime. Uh, yeah, weekends. yeah, yeah. That's right. They would have to pay more for that, uh -huh. so you didn't get many calls <laughs> for Saturday or something. Were, were the studios integrated at all? Uh, at that point? They began to be. I don't. In the when I first started to do it, I, I didn't. I don't remember. But then I remember Bill Green, do you know him? Yeah. Bill Green? Yeah, saxophone no. player. He just died recently. And my buddy Colette, you know, a few guys started coming in. They were right, you know, they forced the issue. Yeah. And uh, there were guys, you know, that could cut the stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, I haven't been, you know, doing what? Ten years or so now. I yeah. haven't done any, so I don't know. I'm sure it's, you know, I'm not sure, but yeah. I would hope, you know, that it's a lot more, right. uh, you know, equal now. Now, do you still get? Um, I don't know if residuals is the correct word. Yeah, that was good. You know that I, uh, I think that came in about 1968. Well, we started getting <coughs> residuals for, I guess the best thing was live TV which would be like the Hollywood Palace, uh, if they show, like if they show clips from that now, mm -hmm. we would get money. And I noticed that a lot of, you know, that they, they're doing Johnny Carson or, uh, or what's the, the gal, uh, that ha the comedian that had a show. And they're doing just, I think it's on the Family Channel. And they're just do, they're doing, it says, you know, like reruns of the Carson show or something. And it's just the comedy stuff. Oh. And I think they redid the theme. I think Tommy Newsom did that. Oh. You know, so the guy, they spent money on that guy. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, like I was on with Pete Fountain, you know, uh -huh. and I, they're not, or oh, he always had a singer. You know, I mean, he had music on his show. Yeah. But evidently they just do the comedy s skits right. Right. on that. So, and that's why, because they have to pay royalties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> residuals. Now, uh, TV, film, there's still no residuals. When they, like all that stuff, they play at Nick at Night, which I did a lot of that. Oh. All those situ situation comedies, you know, from that period. Uh, Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, because that's, you know, that's going to be around. Well, they probably wouldn't be playing it as much, you know, yeah, if they, ha they had true. to pay residuals on yeah. it. Uh, if they turn it into a video, they have to pay something. But if they just play it on television, uh -huh. you know, they can play it a million times. Right. Uh, like, I've, I think I've, we, ha we have a, uh, like a uh, fund where the, when movies were shown on television, we get money. 
and they put all this stuff in a fund, and, and, you get, and you, they send you a check, you know, once a year, all the movies you were in. Or if they take TV shows and they make them into a video, or they make them into a special, like, which they've done. Mm -hmm. Like they take pieces of different TV shows and they make a, a whole new, you know, uh, retrospective or something. Then you get some. Yeah. Anyhow, they put that all in a in the, in the fund. And it's kind of like and surprise money when you get. Yeah, it. no, it's it's been nice. Yeah. yeah. And the gal, you know, in the office there said there'd probably be more of that as the year 2000 comes. Ah. You know that that they'll be putting together these retrospective oh, yeah. things, you know, to show uh -huh. on TV. Right. I'd sure like to see more of the palace. I haven't seen right. too many of those. Yeah. When you get to festivals uh, and parties like this, there's a certain standard uh, number of tunes that you expect people to call. Do you ever get in a situation where people call things you don't know? Oh. Well, first of all, it's, it's the, you know, who's ever the leader on the set, you know, who call the tunes. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, once in a while, there'll be something that, very seldom that I never heard of, you know, or heard. Right. But I might say, oh, gee, I'm not that familiar with that, or that comfortable, or the, mm -hmm. or I haven't played it that often. Or but a lot of times, you know, if we get together before the set, I think I do know this tune. Oh well, let's see. How's it go? You know, and okay. Now where does the bridge goes into what D flat or whatever? You know, just refresh your memory. Right. So then it's no problem. It's it's like if you've heard the tune. You know, if the tune itself is familiar to you, it's really not that big a problem if you have a little time ahead. Uh huh. You know, to think it over and what key and oh right. that kind of modulates here and that. Oh yeah. yeah. So, so there's there's not very many tunes from that period that I, I'm not familiar with as far as that I've heard. You know? Right. What do you listen to these days yourself? Hmm. You know, I got a nice uh, set. I subscribed to Gerald Schwartz, you know, that name. He's conductor of the Seattle Symphony. Uh-huh. He, he was originally a trumpet player, I think. And he, mm -hmm. he was like a virtuoso. From playing, he became a conductor. It must have been like 20 years ago. I remember seeing him at the Pasadena, uh, the small what they call it, the uh, chamber orchestra. And he puts out. He's all, now in Seattle. He puts out this thing of a two CD package, of like you know the basic repertoire of symphony orchestras, and of, of each com set is a different composer. And so you have one CD is the music. And the other CD is like a lecture, oh. you know, with oh. excerpts from yeah. the music and explaining the form and a little bit of the history of the guy's life that sounds and the period and very good, you know. And the, God, you know, like I, you know, just listening to all I had, had most of the stuff on LP, you know, the music. And, but the guy, I people say they don't like CDs. I don't understand. I mean, mm. to me, it's so clear and. No background noise. Yeah. Some people miss, the, miss, they say, the warmth. Yeah, I, the, I don't, uh, of course, people have different ears. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I, women, I think I've heard that it's strident or something. And of course, women are, you know, ha hear higher pitches hmm. than men. Uh, I can't remember when transistor radios and stuff came out. I could kind of hear a little difference, uh -huh. you know, than from the two stuff, so it must be something like that. But what, uh, what you're getting, though, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't annoy me at all. And, and to hear all, especially in the stereo, like I said, you can hear all the individual instruments in mm -hmm. the different sections. So we hear, especially from a composer's standpoint, to hear what the guy's doing. Nothing is covered up. You can hear mm -hmm. everything. You know, and, and maybe because he's, you know, he. He's such a great musician. I mean, he's picking really good. They're not all his performances. I see. But whatever he picks to do, you know, great performances. So I don't know, just to sit down and listen, you know, that's kind of what I've been listening to. I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't get too critical. <laughs> Any current uh, jazz people that, you, that Well, I was just going to say, I, you, we get KL, you know, KLON. Big radio station Yeah, here. it's, it's uh, in Long Beach State College. And I guess the you know the jazz station they yeah. play all 
day long, you know, and they're at night, 24 hours, and they're, on, I guess, on the satellite, and they go all over the country. Every time I turn them on, they're playing the blues. Oh, gee. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I was so happy that we, fi I live out in the desert, you know, high desert. Gee, we got cable, and which we got cable FM along with it. Oh. And then they got KLON. I'm like, hey, oh, this is great. I'll be able to hear, you know, what guys are doing. And uh -huh. I think it's the most accessible kind of jazz, you know, blues. Yeah. I, I don't know what other excuse they have. I don't know, yeah, but I, I, I'm too general, you know, because I don't. Mm -hmm. But I, it kind enough that I don't even turn it on, you know. And then, of course, what's considered jazz today, you know, whatever they call new age jazz or contemporary. I remember uh, on uh, it was a black entertainment channel. They had a series. I, mean, I guess it's still on, but it's not on the same time. Where they did like contemporary, oh, yeah. whatever they call contemporary. I think it's gotten to be. What, it took the place of new age, really, because yes. the the wave. What is it in L.A.? Right. I think plays that kind of stuff now, and that was originally a new age place and the guys are great you know it's good players but it's I think it's just background music mm -hmm. you know that's what people use it for yeah. and it to me it gets monotonous mm -hmm. after a while yeah I guess it's like we used to call mood music right you know? right and uh, it's just not interesting to me you know I admire the performer but just sit down for fun it's almost the Mantovani of yeah, I, I'm 90s. hopeful it isn't that bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, what the heck? You know, they're making yeah. a good living. <laughs> right. Well, I want to thank you for coming and okay. sharing your life story with us. Yeah, I Is hope anything we I covered all bases. Yeah. Um, hope you have a good uh, weekend here. Okay. You seem thank to work you. Uh, have you working pretty hard? Well, yeah, not today. I just got not, one, not today, one set. Yeah, they'll probably set. make up for it. <laughs> yeah, no, the next three days. It's okay. We just four each day. Uh huh. Uh, you know, two in the afternoon, two in the evening. So right. That's, that'll work out. Right. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, I no, appreciate you. Hamilton College. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>